this is a map of uh, carbon emissions on a per person per year basis. So we see places like Australia and America, they're up around 20 tons per person per year. Mark Europe's around about uh, 10, 15 tons per person. The less developed countries are down at uh, maybe one ton per person per year. Um, the global uh, Global average at the moment is around about seven tons per person per year. Uh, but the IPCC have said, look, this isn't sustainable. Uh, this is causing catastrophic climate change. Uh, sustainable level on a per person basis is down around about one ton per person per year. And that's at the, at the current population. Uh, when we consider that the population is increasing, so it's probably going to stabilize around about nine billion. So the models suggest at the moment. Uh, it drops even lower, so less than one ton per person per year. So that's the kind of the end goal, the end target, I guess, for for meeting this this climate change challenge is to get the global emissions on average down to uh, less than a ton per person per year. It doesn't have to be zero, or not at the moment anyway. Uh, if we if we meet that that challenge in the next 50 years, we can the planet can sustain at one ton per person per year. Yeah, if we continue business as usual, the, the level gets lower. But again, yeah, of course, you always have that, that target in your head when you're completing it. This is what I'm trying to do. Uh, how, what, what, what effect am I having on this target or meeting this end goal? Um, so here's a Sankey diagram of the sort of carbon economy, I suppose. On the right there, you've got the greenhouse gases that are contributing to climate change, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide. On the left, you've got the causes of these gases, uh, or the man-made causes of these gases, anyway. So things like transport, electricity and heat, um, making materials, manufacturing, land use change, agriculture, food, uh, waste, getting, getting rid of stuff. And when we think about buildings and building design, again, you've got the obvious uh, electricity and heat that's, that's required to, to run the building, to operate the building. Um, but you've also got all these other factors that come into the building. You've got to transport materials all through the life cycle of a building to, to, to maintain it and to build it, obviously, at the start. You've got to make those uh, materials at the beginning. Uh, you might have some land use change and associated with some of those materials. And you've also got to get rid of them as well. At the end of the life, all buildings do eventually uh, get demolished at some stage. And what happens to those materials at demolition stages also has some environmental impact. Um, so back to that one ton per person per year uh, target. So what does that actually look like when you break it down into your different uh, life um, elements? Um, so I've tried to, what I've done here is taken sort of the, the, the best carbon footprint a person can possibly have really. They've got 100% renewable electricity in their house. They've got a vegetarian diet. They don't use uh, cars for transport, they just run, go by bicycle, they've got uh, you know, a timber frame house, they don't spend much money on, on goods and services. And we see that um, when everything's down as far as it can go, we're actually, for our, for our household, we're down to about 0 0.3, 0 0.27 tonnes per person per year with what we're allowed for our house, because we still got to have these emissions in the bank for, for all the other elements of our life, the waste, for food, um, for, for buying stuff. And then we see the work as well is at 0.17 tons per person per year. So that's the emissions associated with my, my building that I go to work in um, effectively. So uh, we consider the actual buildings. Our target is, is, is again, it's dropped down to 0.3 tons per person per year. Uh, so not a lot, but a uh, big challenge, but definitely uh, ways we can, we can approach that. Um, so how do you know if your choices are sustainable? Look, uh, the, uh, a few months ago we had a um, Porsche, who's a marketing girl in, in Perth in Australia, and she was thinking about buying this laptop stand. She was like, oh, uh, this is a, it's a really cool stand, it's like timber stand, but it's, it's being shipped from Italy, which is obviously a long way from Perth in Australia. And I'm not sure if that's the right thing to do, whether I should get that or just go for you know, a plastic stand that's uh, made locally. In Australia. So although this one sort of had all these eco uh, labels, etc., you, you get with uh, various products that claim sustainability. Um, until you've done the actual analysis, until you've done the full life cycle carbon footprint of this product, you don't know which one um, 
ready for the right thing to do. So we ran it through the software quickly, so we started with the plastic stand. Uh, we had about six kilograms of CO2 at the initial product stage, but actually making the plastics, plastics uh, are fairly uh, high embodied energy, embodied carbon uh, product. We have a very small carbon uh, footprint associated with the transport stage. It's come locally, it hasn't had to travel too far, and a little bit at end of life there. Um, recurring would be when you replace the laptop stand, we're just considering uh, the laptop stand on its own, I suppose, at this stage. Um, so, yeah, a little bit at end of life there, and then when we look, compare that against the timber stand, um, we see that it's much lower. So you've got actually at the product stage, you've got a negative uh, carbon footprint because the, the, you have to grow the trees, they absorb the carbon, uh, uh, sequester it from the atmosphere, and that's locked in into that laptop stand now. So it's a negative value. Um, we have much higher transport impacts because it's come a lot, more, a lot further than the, than the plastic stand there, but we can see that it's, uh, uh, overall it's still much less. We have uh, the end of life impacts there, so that's actually the, uh, when the laptop stand goes to uh, landfill, all those emissions get released and it's actually in the form of methane, so it's quite a high uh, intensive greenhouse gas. So um, overall we still have a much, much more improved product here, the Timber One, even though it's come that much further than the plastic stand. But uh, what we learned, I guess, from doing the analysis is that, hey, actually, these impacts at end of life are, are quite big. And if we uh, recycled it or burnt it for heat or, or just combusted it on its own, even for carbon dioxide, it's much better than methane in terms of impact. Then we're going to uh, lower the carbon footprint of this product even further and actually have an overall probably a negative uh, or at least neutral carbon neutral product there. So, uh, uh, yeah, just from doing that comparison, quite a lot of lessons learned and quite an interesting uh, exercise to run because nobody in the office really, really had any idea uh, what, what the outcome would be, even though we've, we've been doing our CH for six or seven years now. Um, and the same applies to buildings. So you have your material stage, you know, the materials need to be manufactured, need to be mined, need to uh, be, products need to be produced. Uh, then they need to be transported to the site, at the site they are assembled, so there's impacts associated with, with the trade staff that come and put things together with all the equipment that's used. We also have, then have the operational, obviously you have to heat and cool the building, uh, then you have to maintain it, you have to repaint it, you have to recarpet it, you have to uh, replace various products throughout the life cycle of, of the building. Eventually uh, those um, products, uh, the building comes to its end of its life and you have disposal impacts and you have to account for that. And, uh, but that's not the end of the story. So we have um, what's called the functional unit. So it's not just about embodied carbon. You have to actually consider what's the purpose of this building and is it being effectively used uh, uh, to, to meet its goals, to meet its end game. So here's a classic example of the uh, coffee machine. So on the left there you have uh, a very low embodied carbon, very lightweight uh, plastic coffee machine. And on the right here you have very intensive, very heavy duty steel and a lot of manufacturing, a lot of high impact materials have gone into this one on the right here. Um, so when you compare them just straight up, you say, okay, the one on the left has much lower impact, so let's go for that. But when you consider the purpose of the which is to make cups of coffee, you'll quickly understand that the one on the left is only going to uh, produce maybe 200 cups of coffee over its life before it sort of breaks down and, and you throw it out, whereas the one on the right is probably going to make 200 cups of coffee every day. Uh, so when you consider the impacts in terms of kilograms of CO2 per cup of coffee made, which is the purpose of these machines, uh, yeah, you come to the conclusion that the one on the right is actually probably uh, much more, much more effective at producing those cups of coffee. But you, again, you have to consider the purpose of the, of the machine. And the same applies for buildings. So we have a functional unit for building. Quite often, it's occupant per year, or meter squared per year, or meter squared of living space per year. So you can have the most sustainable building in the world, have the 
renewable energies and the low impact materials. But if you only put one person in there, it's not going to be as effective as maybe uh, some older building or um, not so efficient building that's uh, piled full of people. So we had a really interesting uh, job uh, a year or so ago. It was an emergency services call center. So there was people in this building 24 hours a day working in the building answering the phones for fire and police, etc. And they were answering the phone every day. So the, the impacts already, before we even looked at the design, the impacts per occupant per year uh, were really low. Because you've got uh, double the occupancy almost of, of a normal uh, of, an, of a normal building where you only have people in it probably eight hours a day for five days a week. This was now 24 hours a day. So again, it's a, uh, functional unit, think about it in terms of occupant per year or even occupant hour per year in that case. And you can have some really big effects on designs when you start to think about functionality, uh, life cycle functionality, before you even start to look at materials and energy and all the rest of the, the, the sort of standard things. Um, we do look at multiple impact categories, so at the moment our primary focus, I guess, is is on CO2. This is probably the, well, certainly the biggest uh, environmental uh, problem that, that we're facing in society at the moment. Uh, but we do have all these other impact indicators that we can look at, things like acidification and ozone and land use. And, and uh, at some stage, we'll start to see maybe a CO2 problem gets fixed. Um, hopefully, <laughs> uh, over the next 10 or 20 years, uh, we might see some of these other uh, indicators become more important, and then you have start to have some interesting trade-offs between between the two. So, for example, timber buildings come out very well in terms of CO2, but when you consider the land use change in timber, uh, it's uh, it's very high. So you have to think about this trade-off between these different different designs. At the moment, yeah. generally, a lot of these indicators, acidification, PSC things, they do align quite well with greenhouse gas emissions, but uh, for certain things, um, they might not. Ozone there is another one. Where solar panel manufacturing has quite a high impact in terms of ozone. You might have to think about in the future when CO2 is, is not such a big problem. Is it worth putting new solar panels on for this other, other problem that you're making? So it's something that we're starting to think about slowly, and uh, BRE and BRIAM uh, developing a sort of uh, matrix, I guess, for for understanding how these different other indicators uh, affect each other. Uh, so design versus rating, yeah, as I was saying earlier, you get really excited when you can get involved earlier in a design and have some big impacts or functionality. Uh, we can use the tool at pre-design stage, so before we've even got um, drawings, we can plug in some general templates for, for buildings or standard buildings and start to play around with different design ideas. That's the sort of stage where you can uh, uh, you know, decide things like, um, so you might have a, a lift shaft uh, and you might be considering uh, what's the impact of reducing this number of lifts. So I'll go from four lifts down to two lifts. I increase my floor plate, so that's good because there's uh, you know, less carbon in the and all the materials that go into that building on a per person basis, I can get more people into the building. I've got all this extra lift space now. But I'm going to have to increase the speed of these other two lifts to make up for that. And uh, that's the sort of analysis that you can only really apply it at design stages and, and, uh, and get some really interesting results. And uh, then obviously design and construction, you start to look at material specification, we can always get involved in that, reduce impacts there. As we get further down along the building's life cycle, we can have less of an impact. But at all stages during the life cycle, we can apply LCK and present some uh, good findings, good learning results. Um, so we don't just look at uh, residential and commercial buildings. We can also look at whole developments, whole uh, master plans, or like bits of infrastructure. And um, it sort of comes back to that one ton per person per year sort of target. So we can. Uh, someone's house, have done the LCA on their house, and it's getting like three tons per person per year, and their office was one ton per person, and they had to drive across this bridge, and this was like 200 kilograms per crossing, or whatever it might be, and um, yeah, to really get an understanding of, of oh, okay, here's my life cycle impacts for everything, and, 
and uh, this, is, this is where the hotspots are, these are the places where I need to focus my attention, design of the buildings, design of, of, the, of the bridge of functionality. So, uh, uh, yeah, it gets really exciting when you start to get involved in, in all these different, different types of projects. Um, we talked a little bit about um, emerging standards. So this is the standard that the, the tool is, is compliant with, I guess. It's the uh, European standard, basically, much international standard for, for completing life cycle assessments of buildings. So anyone that's um, using our tool is EN 15978 compliant uh, up to the, the, the data within it. Is, the results will be in 15978 compliant. It means you can compare your LCA with anyone else and an LCA that's complied with this standard. It's only emerged the last uh, couple of years and has now been incorporated into things like Green Star um, and Briem International, where they, oh, actually I'll get onto that in a second. Um, uh, so how the tool affects uh, consultancy on environmental assessments? Well, you can get three points. Uh, in LEED for doing an LCA, you can get two points in REM construction in the UK, two percentage points, uh, that's on top of your normal materials credit. And in REM International, actually, you get six, nearly six, over 6% six of your points uh, for doing an LCA in eTool. They have a sort of sliding scale, uh, depending on the tool you use, it affects how many, how many points you're able to award, that's uh, quite thorough compliant with uh, the full standard, so um, yeah, you get quite a high level uh, percentage points there from Green International. Um, uh, but for, before you go down that route, you probably want to have a quick look at, um, uh, you know, whether this is effective, this is a cost-effective way of achieving points, okay, I know that I'm getting, doing an LCA and I get good feedback on the design and, and uh, that's great, but I want to make sure that I'm delivering value to the client. Uh, in terms of getting the most uh, out of the assessment, um, is, is, is that money better spent? Uh, is the LCA money better spent? And other areas of the, of the building environmental assessment tool where, uh, you know, maybe it's sound or environment or whatever else. Um, so here's a little example. Uh, this is the office building in Perth, 30,000 meters squared office building. Um, and uh, we did the LCA for it, it took about 60 hours. And we charged the client there uh, 25,000 euros to, to complete the LCA. Uh, we got some good feedback uh, with the design teams, even though we came on quite late on the design on this one, but it was already fairly specified. Um, we were able to put forward some, some solutions that, that, were, that were considered, and, uh, and they achieved the points as well at the end. So, so some good learning outcomes all around there. Um, so I will now jump into the software. So just yeah, a bit of background there. I always like to spend a bit of time on that just to give everyone a sort of understanding of where we're at, where we're, where we're trying to get to, what we're trying to achieve. So the software is web-based. It means that anyone can uh, access it anytime. Here's the address here. Uh, um, and it also means that we're able to update it, able to continuously improve the software without having to, you know, release new, new versions and send out CDs or whatever it might be as downloads. Um, it's continuously updating every week. Something new happens. Uh, so excuse me if uh, uh, something looks slightly different here that I get a bit stuck on because every week I do this sort of presentation and we have some new feature that we can add or something works a little bit differently, or usually a bit better. Um, so we have, um, this is my list of projects uh, that I've been working on over the last year or two, and I'll just jump into a blank project just to uh, show you around. So within my project folder, I would have um, a number of different design iterations. So my base design and then my improved design and some recommendations that I've, that I've run on the design. Uh, I might have you know, a precinct where I want to look at a, an office and, a, and another house for a residential unit and um, all within this one project. So up here I have uh, inputs that will be constant throughout all of these different designs. So things like, again, okay, where is it located? 
uh, what database do I want to use? So at the moment we use Australasian LCI database. Um, very soon we'll be able to uh, have, have options of different databases here. So we might have ECO and Bench, which might be Europe, more European centric, or other databases that become available. We'll be able to uh, feed them into the design. At the moment, Australasian um, is pretty good. And what we found is that actually there's not that huge difference on a, on a total building scale between the different databases, but something interesting to run uh, nonetheless as a, as a sensitivity. Uh, we also have things like the grid, so we have uh, numerous different types of grids here. If I was going for, um, I don't know what one's from here, but there's a South African one, or there's a US one. Uh, uh, if, you, if you're in an area and you can't find the, the grid there, then uh, just drop us a line and uh, we, can, we can try and update it. Um, uh, so import grid, export grid, gas grid, all these things will uh, be constant throughout these designs. What's the water grid supply, say, so might go for UK or Australia or just a general one. Um, yeah, again, if you've got a specific area in mind, we, uh, we've got some data, we can find some data on it, we can easily update this. Uh, doesn't take too long. Um, so yeah, once I've got that sort of established, I will uh, jump into um, creating new models. So here's a, a, a blank design, and what you can see here is the life cycle. Uh, sort of stages on the right here, product stage, transport stage, construction stage, recurring, energy, water, end of life, reuse as well. And over here, these are all the elements that go into the building. So people need to go in, equipment needs to go in, all the materials obviously need to go in, and then our operation stuff, our energy and water, all these things that have life cycle impacts. So um, let's say we start with a roof, and I go into roof, and I want to add in some tiles or something. So what I do is I go to add roof, I go to um, covering. I now have access to the full the materials database, I suppose, and I need to pick which uh, material that the software will then be able to grab as sort of background data and apply it on by quantity to, to the material that I've added. So I said so I was going to add some tiles. Um, let's go for some clay roofing tiles, maybe for a house or something. Uh, just put a description there, clay tiles. And now I put in the quantity, so I might have an actual uh, weight of tiles that I know that's uh, been ordered for this particular job, or more likely um, from an earlier stage, I know the area of tiles, so maybe there's, uh, I don't know, five, five square meters of tiles, actually let's say 50 square meters of tiles. Uh, one, two, three. So yeah, one meter by, by 50 meters, 50 square meters. Uh, maybe the tiles are, uh, say, 10 mil big. And there's one of these roofs, maybe there's, there's more. And that spits out the, the total volume there. And I have some other impacts here that, that I might want to run as sensitivities or test. Um, things like construction waste factor, maybe the client's got a specific target for how much is lost in waste. Otherwise, I've tend to just leave these as as default values, I'll still damage and transport, AA material life. So what's the material life of, of a tile? Um, it's probably around about 50 years, but if I wasn't uh, sure I wanted to look up, I can go on the little references tab here and have access to our reference library. So lots of different sources of information here for different elements of LCAs, uh, things like recycling data or, or uh, materials quantities, or if I uh, was looking at life expectancy, just search like expectancy of life, and uh, here's some references for uh, different material lifespans for different building construction materials. So I click on a link there and I can have a quick look into uh, uh, what other people have considered an appropriate life for, for these different materials. So, uh, quite useful. Uh, things like maintenance, repair intervals, again, that will leave that as defaults for now. Uh, but you can run these sort of tests if you want. What happens to the material at the end of its life? Does it get recycled or does it just go to landfill? Uh, then we have the transport distance. So at the moment, this is the default distance that we have in the software for 
uh, for all the different materials. But if I knew specifically where this material was coming from, or I wanted to run that as a, as a scenario, what's the difference between tiles from Australia versus tiles from uh, I don't know, UK or somewhere, then I can put this in, uh, in manually, manual locations, or manual distances by different uh, uh, transport modes here. Uh, again, I'll leave it as a file now. And you can even go to what happens at the end of a life, or what happens to this material at the end of a life. Is there a recycling plant particularly close by that, that it goes to that we can uh, uh, apply a transport distance to that? Again, uh, easier to leave it at, at default so for now, but we do have that ability to, to run these quite uh, acute tests. Uh, so now I've added in that material. We can see initially uh, for clay tiles, product stage is 400 uh, kilograms CO2. We have end of life there and transport quite small, so um, and recurring construction is, is, is minimal. Um, so that's all well and good, uh, but obviously it would take far too long to add in every single material in a, in, a, in a building. So we've got our material and a clip for this roof, but we still need to add in the structure of the roof, the finishes of the roof, the paint, and somebody has to come and, and do all these things, and there might be some equipment associated with doing all these things. So uh, what we've got is um, templates where we have done a bit of background research. OK, what is the uh, volume of plasterboard, the number of structure trusses, the number of tiles, etc., etc within a roof, whole roof structure, and um, added that in as a template and uh, sort of amalgamated it on a per meter square basis. So uh, I'll just search now, we have uh, a whole roof one. So here maybe we have um, clay tile, timber truss, at a 25 degree pitch. So we have some details here about what will be included in this template. Yeah, we can see we've got a our trusses for the structure, materials and assembly. Um, it's installed on a slope. Uh, it's also got some insulation in it, uh, flat plasterboard ceiling, ceilings that are uh, plasterboard mounted from patterns. There's even some gutters um, and uh, down packs, etc. in there. Um, so I said 50 meters squared in there, so we'll add in 50 meters squared for this roof. Say so that, I mean, you see very quickly we've populated a whole roof now, right? pretty much. We've got yeah, the structure, the gutter, and we can quickly have a look down this list and pick out what are the big impacts here. So we can see there the tiles are very significant uh, at 1,000 uh, kilograms of CO2. Uh, also significant down here is the passport. The passport and the ceiling is quite high. Uh, so I was thinking about improving this roof. Those are the two areas that I've immediately uh, want to look at, and then, yeah, and then we have insulation also uh, quite high. Um, so yeah, so we have templates for, for um, whole buildings, uh, whole, whole uh, roof elements, whole wall elements, whole floor elements, and we can quickly uh, the template library is, is, is building every day. I just jump into that now, actually. Every new job we have, we um, come across the odd new template uh, that then gets added to the library and it's all uh, globally available. So uh, every user has full access to this, this library here. You can see um, these templates um, when it has a little globe here. That means the template is um, uh, open to everyone. If you had uh, some a client who uh, maybe has some sensitive information in their wall, uh, Material spec or, or something specific that they want to keep private, then you can make the template private and you, that means that only you have access to it. We also have templates, uh, yeah, these ones with the green ticks. Okay. Uh, the green tick means that it's been validated. So we've actually gone in and um, referenced every single element that's come from this template and every piece of information has a source of. Of it's not just a, an assumption, it's a very solid template to use. So uh, the green ticks uh, yeah, have that extra level of validation against, against them. It's, uh, we've gone in and checked it, checked the template that it's, uh, it's uh, appropriate and, and accurate. Um, so if you had a template or if you had a roof element that wasn't quite 
in the library. It's very quick and easy to just jump into uh, into the one that's maybe closest. Uh, let's say I wanted to make a brick wall that was finished, and I couldn't find that in the library. There is one library that's finished, but uh, oh, maybe it's uh, it's uh, much thicker. Maybe it's 200 mil concrete blocks. So I can quickly uh, clone that template. Click clone. Uh, that makes a copy of the template, which I am now able to update and add that extra bit of material or take away whatever's relevant from the from the um, uh, for the specification that, that I have for this job. Um, sure it's here. Not this one. Or even have nested templates, so you can have uh, a plasterboard and you can add that into another template uh, for a total wall system and. Um, uh, yeah, and develop these quite complex templates. So we would we have templates for whole buildings. So you, if you're interested in that early stage analysis, you can take a concrete structure office block template, uh, which includes a number of sort of nested templates and things like like what you're looking at here for the walls for the roof for the thing. And, and you add that in as a as a meter square basis, and you already have a whole building model basically. Uh, that you can run very quick, very rough and ready analysis on. Obviously, you haven't gone out and measured all the windows and all the uh, number of doors, etc., etc. You've just got a rough model ready because you don't have that information available yet. Um, so, very uh, quick and easy way, I hope to you see to, to build a, a model. I jump into a um, a completed model. Uh, so this is a large office in Perth, probably that one that you um, uh, were looking at before, or, or one similar. And these are its uh, life cycle impacts. So um, what we're looking at here, actually, is a good time to go into uh, functional units. So at the moment, we're looking at uh, total impacts in terms of, of CO2, uh, so the total impacts of this building over its life. Um, but what is the life cycle of the building? At the moment, we've assumed it's 60 years. So uh, this is a details tower where we can update things like uh, the function and the, and the lifespan. So we have 60 years at the moment. Um, that was the value that was actually required for this uh, particular assessment um, by the PRB um, or lead of someone, whoever it was. We also have a little algorithm in here that will tell you how uh, what the predicted lifespan of the building is. It's a little bit rough and ready, but it's a, it's a good way to get an idea. So generally buildings uh, aren't knocked down because they're crumbling to pieces. They're knocked down because it's uh, more economical to uh, build something higher or more dense in its place. Um, so this is a function of, of that. So you have your design quality. But obviously, the higher the design quality, the harder it is to knock down something. Uh, you know, St. Paul's Cathedral will never get knocked down because it's got extremely high uh, architectural quality. Um, we also have a number of owners. The more owners that a building has, the harder it would be for a developer to come in and buy all the owners out and knock it down. So if I drop this down to only one owner, we see that the lifespans, the predicted lifespans, actually drop down to 25 years there. And um, we also have, importantly, the location. So if it's in a very high inner city location, um, it's very uh, more likely that uh, developers will come in and want to knock it down. Whereas if it's out in a rural location or suburban, um, it will be much hard, uh, much less likely that someone needs to come in and knock this building down or replace it. So you see there it's jumped up to 90 years. So interesting little algorithm just to play with and give, give you an idea of what the predicted lifespan of a building is. Uh, we also have, okay, this is the function of the building. So how many occupants does it have? How many tenancies? How many workstations? Operating hours? What's the floor areas? And some of these uh, elements, they can be used in templates. You might have a lighting template that's based on, on the floor area. So you have X number of lights per meter squared of, of uh, office floor area. So when you plug that template in, it grabs this value here and uses that in its, in its uh, calculations. Likewise, with um, you might know the heating and cooling demands from modeling or from certain targets that it has to meet. Um, what's the 
it's uh, ventilation, it's lighting. These can all be used in templates, particularly operational templates. And here we have the functional units. So how do I want to express the results? Uh, I might want to go per occupant and per year. And I'll save that. And we will now see the results expressed in terms of per occupant per year. So thinking about that target, how are we doing? Okay, we're 1,000 kilograms per occupant per year for this office. So one ton per person per year. So um, it could be worse, I suppose, but yeah, it needs to be a lot better to, uh, to solve the problem. <laughs> um, uh, what else are we go so here we have our base model, and um, that's all well and good. We have, our, we have a good understanding of where the impacts are. We can see uh, these are very high operational impacts. Maybe I think about some strategies to reduce them. Also, floors looks quite high here. I might click into floors. Um, what's the B impact there? Uh, just quickly scroll down here, and I see that um, uh, this reinforcement is quite high at 40 kilograms per occupant. Um, the concrete as well here at 20. The bulk of the impacts are to do with the concrete in the, in the slab of these floors. So then, I already know that that's going to be an effective strategy to reduce um, my impacts versus maybe something like the formwork. You, know, you might want to go recycle timber for formwork, but I know that that's only going to have a very minimal effect on the life cycle impacts of this design because this figure is very low. I don't know that I need to target these, these hot spots and there should be some easy wins there compared to tackling the, the other end of the case that, that aren't so significant. Uh, so now I have my building out, I want to make some improvements. So what I would do in this case is, is clone this, this building. So I have a copy of, of my base design that I can uh, sort of refer to. I want to clone the building and make some improvements, make right? some recommendations. So uh, I'll clone it, I'll call it something like uh, improved design. I've actually already done this, so I'll jump into that now. Um, and now I want to run some tests, I want to run some you know, uh, analysis on, on, on improvements and recommendations. So I can go to the uh, recommendations tab, I can uh, already run one here, so um, the software is able to record the impact that, change, that you make to changes in the design, uh, which is very useful. So I have a recommendations library, in this case I ran uh, fly ash in the concrete, what's it like to um, uh, change the concrete so that it has 50% fly ash replacement for concrete, which is uh, uh, quite an effective strategy for reducing impacts of concrete. Uh, I can see that I've had some significant savings in, in uh, CO2, and um, they're locked in at the start of the of the life, and the, the concrete obviously lasts the whole life of the building. Um, so the saving is, is is the same at the start as it is at the end of the life. When you apply operational savings, you see it increases over the life cycle. These savings are locked in at the very start. Something very important about uh, life cycle analysis is uh, embodied carbon. It becomes quite important because you can, you're guaranteed those savings from the very beginning. Operational savings, they make quite a lot of assumptions over what's going to happen to operational energy, to electricity grids over the life of this building, over the next 50, over the next 100 years. Um, you know, what's going to happen to those, and you have to make some assumptions there, where these embodied um, emissions, they're guaranteed, they're locked in uh, uh, right from the start. In this case, we can see fly ash okay, increased a little bit in cost, um, uh, but all these other impact indicators, land use, ozone, uh, eutrophication, etc., they've all got uh, negative values. Um, actually, ozone doesn't, that's a positive one. So it's a very small increase in ozone associated with fly ash, probably to do with with the actual transport, so to get fly ash maybe increased a bit in transport to, to um, get the fly ash to the site uh, versus normal concrete. So that's actually increased the ozone there. Um, uh, but yeah, I can see once I've done this analysis that I uh, uh, have uh, a good recommendation to put forward there. Um, how did I run this? So actually what I would have done is go to bulk swap. 
So once I press uh, record, um, uh, I can go to bulk swap. And here I have a list of all the materials that are in my model. And I can now make changes to, to those materials. So in this case, it was concrete. I've already done it there for that one. Um, we have a concrete in the walls, so maybe I want to run a recommendation again to see what's the effects of having it in the having flash in the walls as well. Um, I can now make changes to um, uh, this concrete here. Maybe I want to change the uh, recycled content. Maybe I want to change where the transport distance in or the quantity. Maybe I've used some uh, other thing like a, a bubble deck where they replace the, the actual balls. Uh, concrete with uh, plastic balls full of air, and that might reduce the, the concrete quantity by 50% or something like that. You can change that. In this case, though, I might, I'm just going to change the actual materials. So I'll change it from concrete to concrete with fly ash in it. So, uh, a lot of different concretes here, and I just swap it for that one. It puts plus there, and I can see the change that that's had in the design, and I can apply that, and uh, that will then swap out that concrete in, um, from uh, what was there before. I'll leave it, leave it for now. Uh, what else can I show you? Probably about 10 15 minutes left. So. Okay, so we talked about global warming potential, we talked about other uh, impact indicators, so it's very easy to, just to flip between. Uh, global warming, maybe you're interested in cost, okay, here's some, uh, some dollar figures for, for this design, quite interesting there that you see that actually the people in this, in, in this uh, model of the most significant cost of, of over the life cycle of a building. Operational energy is quite high, but people is massive. I'm going to be interested in that, so quickly jump into people, what's the cost of the, where's this coming from? Uh, this one's quite high. Uh, people have to come and, and replace the carpets. That's a you know, million dollars over the life cycle of the building. Is there anything else there? Um, it's all quite. Um, quite a, a thorough model. This a lot of uh, elements of people. Ah, here we see a cleaner as well. So having a cleaner come every day or you know, every couple of weeks to clean the windows is quite significant. That's a one and a half million dollars over the life of the building. Um, uh, the electrician coming to, so these are all sort of recurring costs that never really get thought about I guess in the design. And there might be things you can do. Uh, maybe you want to uh, have some sort of self-cleaning window mechanism that, uh, that doesn't require some trade stuff to come or you might want to just uh, coat the windows with something that means that they don't need wood cleaning so often. Uh, likewise with carpets, you might want to um, not have carpets because they cost a lot to replace, never mind the cost of the actual carpet. And uh, I think that's... Um, ah, and here's an even bigger one. So here's the massive impact it's with, with the actual cleaners that are coming to the office. So. Um, to clean the carpets rather than to replace them, which was a million dollars, we actually have uh, nearly a hundred million dollars um, when you add these two together uh, for the carpet cleaner to come every day, clean the carpets, or clean the whole office, but which generally means you know wiping the desk and the hoover of the carpet is actually costing a significant amount of money here. So um, if I wanted to reduce my life cycle costs, then then that was the analysis, and now I'd be looking at strategies to reduce the, the cleaning. Um, requirement of a building, you know, dark colored carpets maybe, which would help, or, or whatever it might be. Uh, and yeah, we can click on to some other things, so maybe we look at ozone. Um, and we can quickly run similar sort of analysis on ozone, so I might jump into floors, what's the high impact in floors, and have, have a have play around with different strategies that I can do to, to impact on ozone. Again, you can know generally our library and our template library is uh, around recommendations. Uh, so everyone has access to the template library. I think we're talking about let's do it now. Uh, so you can add it from a template. So we've got um, various different recommendations that we've come across over our designs, and every time we do them, we add them 
into the library here. So, uh, really important to have a good understanding of, of you know, we would always apply at least 20 recommendations to a design, even though we, we think we know what the outcome will be, you know, solar panels are going to come out pretty good. You always want to run it just to check it against the, the, the design in this particular design, maybe I'm in a different location, solar panels aren't, uh, you know, the embodied impacts of that panel aren't quite making up for the uh, operational savings because we're in Brazil or somewhere that has a very low impact uh, grid already. So I want to run these recommendations for every design and make sure that I'm prioritizing the, the most cost effective and the most uh, carbon effective uh, strategies for, for improving my building. Uh, let's quickly run through this tab here. So this is the M15978 tab. So we have our impacts just split out into the different stages required for EN15978. Uh, we also have our EPD tab, so if you have an EPD, it's an environmental product declaration, it's where someone has done a full LCA of um, the, their products, the carpet or their table or whatever it might be, and we can add that in into the design here if they specified a uh, product that has an EPD. Here's just a summary of the templates that I've got in this library. Uh, I've included the, the embodied of the total building as a uh, um, as a single template. We can quickly look into what's within that that embodied template. Here we have a, an extensive list of, of everything that's gone in, and we can have a look at okay into concrete that's got high impact again. Another way is just to run a quick analysis of of the results and, and present what, what you're looking at. Uh, speaking of presenting, let's uh, jump into the reports tab. So how do we want to present these uh, results? We're not a big fan of um, taking data and copying it into a spreadsheet and then copying a graph into a report and then PDF the report and then there was a mistake in the report so then we have to go back to Word and then, uh, you know how it is with the, uh, consulting type job. So we've got automated reports, so we can actually run automatic reports out of the software, uh, which is really handy actually. For, so we have different graphs and different uh, uh, results, different analysis that we can run and send through uh, some of the outputs that we, that we offer uh, to you all there after the presentation. Uh, for now, I might just run the LCA report. So I actually have to do that from my base design. Uh, so I'll go here. Go reports, new report. And here I'm going to do the actual full LCA report that we were able to produce. And I'll go. Uh, let's go and we'll stick with this office benchmark. So that's an average office that we've um, built a benchmark around. You might have your own benchmark that you want to use, or you might want to use some of our benchmarks. We have full access to, to all of them. We have sort of Australian-focused ones. We have international ones. We have more uh, building new benchmarks. And then I have my actual, uh, how do I want to compare it against? So I'll do it against the improved design. Um, what do I want to look at? Let's stick with global warming, but I could look at any one of these other impacts. And let's present the results in terms of power compliance. Uh, so now I have an automated report. So here's my office. Um, Bit of a summary of what's going on. Here's the uh, recommendation that I ran. Normally I'd have maybe 20 or 30 recommendations and a summary of, of how they're doing and we can do a comparison of, of uh, which ones are uh, important. There are a few graphs here. Here's the, here's the benchmark design in yellow and the current design and the, and the improved design. We can see the improved design is slightly lower embodied impact than the, the, the base design. Uh, and then some graphs to just present the analysis, a bit of background and the scope and the goals of the study, uh, what's what's included, what's not included, uh, description of the building, etc., uh, etc. Et now this watermark here uh, is because the design is not certified, so part of our uh, work is always to certify 
uh, someone's design. So once you complete, if you're completing the analysis um, in-house, you would uh, then present the model to us, and we would certify it. We'd run through the model with you, uh, run through any uh, anomalies or things you yeah. quite stack up. Uh, uh, maybe talk about some improvements or recommendations, and uh, you know, grow the knowledge, grow the community of, of uh, LCA practitioners. And, uh, once we've done that, these uh, watermarks come off the um, uh, reports. Um, so I will um, take some questions now, I guess, if anyone has any questions um, around the software. Um, feel free to type them down in that chat box down there. Yes, it's a bunny, right? It's more simple. Um, 